everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, episode two, I guess uh, you could call it, of How to Sail Your Etchels. I'm uh, your host, Alex Curtis, uh, you know, still novice etchel sailor. Uh, I'm joined by my good friend and etchels expert, uh, Eric Doyle, uh, who's recently now uh, the ice boat king. Uh, Eric, where where are you tuning in from today? You've been Mr. Uh, Mr. Worldwide the last few weeks. Hey, Alex, how you doing? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, I made it in. I made it. Uh, I made it back to Minnesota the other night. So I'm here in uh, just outside of beautiful Lake Minnetonka in the in the prairie land. Nice, nice. Well, we're gonna we're gonna talk about some uh, heavier air etchels uh, sailing. Um, you know, we, we've been pretty blessed to have some great, uh, sailing, you know, we started out kind of the same week as the Coral Reef Cup, the guys in San Diego sailed the Billy Bennett, which is a notorious, uh, Etchell's regatta. And it was so windy that they had to sail in South Bay, which is uh, kind of Southern San Diego Bay, very flat water, you know, pretty similar to sailing in like a Miami, you know, Northwesterly or Westerly wind. Um, so we're going to try and focus on some flat water uh, technique uh, on how to trim the sails and set up the boat. And then Eric and I sailed the Etchell's Midwinters West out in the ocean and Coronado Roads in San Diego, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, where there was big waves and big wind and it was awesome, just, you know, real Etchell sailing. Um, so, but uh, we just wanted to start by uh, saying here at North Sails, you know, we're always trying to progress forward and uh the and come up with new techniques on how to trim the sails and use different sails on the boat this is uh north sales expert chris larson uh revisiting a sail development project of sailing upwind with your spinnaker and eric i think we determined that there's a little bit too much drag to sail upwind with a kite huh you can see his height is really lacking in this picture he's there's probably got some good speed through the water but look at his pointing it's not it's not working out so well. No, this Swiss so guy, man, he's, he's going on the moon. Again. Yeah, yeah, it's not going well. So that is uh, one thing not to do. So uh, let's start with some things to do. So, you know, we got there. We, um, uh, we trained on the first day in a really nice southeasterly wind. And we learned a lot about the technique of how to get the main set up. How do you adjust the traveler? Talk to us a little bit about what we learned kind of on that on that first training day yeah it was great we we're uh we we're in miami and uh had four days of beautiful wind first day was southerly so it was a little bit more bumpy but then it came out of the north and uh i watched the boys race for uh three days in a northerly which in miami is quite a protected bay you know this is very relevant like alex said about sailing in south bay san diego flat water flat, flat water. So the, the gist of this whole webinar, we're going to be talking primarily about setting the boat and the main up in flat water versus very bumpy water. And we had a lot of windy conditions too. So, you know, the Etchell is quite powerful. It's got a lot of sail area, it's, but it's a big boat. It needs the power. And the, the, the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway we had from the weekend in Miami was, you know, in, in 15 knots and above, it's just about how flat you can get the main, how tight you can get the forestay, and how hard you can hike, and, and basically in that order. Um, so we we just looked at getting the main as flat as we could possibly get, so that we could sheet the main as hard as we could to help keep the forestay tight, and then in order to keep the boat on its feet from not healing too much we were dropping the traveler a lot. So we could keep that main sheet really tight. We can keep that forestay tight. Um, so we were, we were using a lot of backstay. We were cranking the rigs tight, tight. You know, we we're up, uh, how, many, how many steps up were you in the uh, most of that weekend, Alex, in the max breeze? In the max wind, we were three turns on the caps and 10 turns on the lowers. Yeah, so 10 turns. And then there was also times where it was so windy, you know, we were, we were, making the mast very straight or even in this picture you can see jesse he's sighting the mast the mast when you look up the side it's got to be super straight or maybe even the spreaders poke to weather just the tiniest bit but uh you know we go from sagging the mast 
to making sure that the mass is super straight. We want the main very, very flat. You can see the cross section of this mass. It's super straight. Uh, the sail is very flat. You can see the traveler is down below center line because we don't want to ease the sheet because the water is fairly flat and we can we can drive around it. We keep the four state tight, you know, and, and the main sheet contributes a lot to that. So that was the biggest thing we learned in, in Miami. And like I said, you know, South Bay would be very similar. Yeah. And when we showed up, you know, I, I'm so used to sailing in the ocean and you know, kind of easing the main, you know, I do a lot of J70 sailing and obviously the way that you know, I, I had to get myself back into Etchell's mode of, you know, you don't want to ease the sheet. You know, don't, don't really want to ease the sheet in J70 either, but, you know, keeping the traveler. And one of the things that I was worried about is we now, our sheeting angles are so narrow. I was worried that dropping the traveler might create Lee Helm. But what we learned is if there's ever any hint of Lee Helm, you have to just move the lead out a little bit and the boat will be res responsive to it. If you move the lead out, you try get the traveler down, you play the traveler a lot, the boat just goes in a straight line and you end up pointing a lot higher. So don't really worry. You know, you're trying to get the boat going as fast as you can in a straight line and worry, you know, the height will come with speed. Um, so, and this was a dramatic difference from what I was normally doing. And it took me a couple of days to kind of figure it out. But I think by the end, you know, the, the technique was a little bit more refined. Um, one of the things that we learned a lot about is, is the mass ram in this weekend, you know, the, the, so Eric, why don't you talk a, a little bit about that? You know, we got a, we got a push mechanism and we have a pull mechanism in the last, uh, in the last webinar, we talked a lot about the push and now let's talk a little bit about the pull. What does the pull do to the mass and the wholesale profile? Yeah, here you can see, this is, uh, this is team rock on again, going up winded Miami looking pretty nice because uh, the first thing that strikes me is, is how tight the forestay is. Uh, and you achieve that with a lot of backstay tension and main sheet tension. And as you pull it backstay, it obviously makes the mass bend a lot. And when the mass starts over bending, we, you know, we wanna do whatever we can to stiffen the mass, especially in the lower section. And that's where the mast ram comes in. We, we pull the mast ram all the way back at the deck um, and pull the backstay very, very hard until we start to see the main turn inside out. And if it's turning inside out too quickly, you know, then we, we've got to look at other ways to, to stiffen the mast. And that is where the mast ram and the mast butt are going to control, you know, basically from the spreaders down. We make the mast super stiff. You can see how straight it is fore and aft. And that lets us pull that backstay on really, really hard. And the more we bend the mast in the upper sections, the more we flatten it. And then the boat, if it's still overpowered, then we drop the traveler down a little bit and we start uh, keeping, letting the boat not heal too much. Remember, we're talking about a lot of wind here. We're talking about flat water, okay? So we want the mast, the main flat. We want the boat on its feet, but still have some power. And then, you know, one thing we did experiment with a little bit with Alex if, and these guys is if the boat's still a little bit too bound up, we can't quite get it flat enough, then, then we might ease the ram just a, just a little bit at the deck, like a, a quarter inch or a half inch, you know, just really small increments because that helps flatten out the bottom of the sail a little more, which, which will relieve the helm and let the boat go through the water nicely. So we, we tried that. That's kind of a last thing. But generally, once it's over about 16 knots, we, we pull the ram all the way back and we, we kind of leave it there so we can pull the backstay hard enough to flatten the main. Yeah. Yeah. I doubt that I think that that was my biggest takeaway from that whole weekend, other than, you know, the different technique of trimming the main is is the 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 ram and the effect that it has on the mass and the sails. And, you know, I personally haven't done a ton of sailing in a lot of wind. And um, so, I, I mean, it was pretty nice to, to learn all of this stuff just on uh, in, in one whole weekend. And it, and it looks like it's going to be the same thing this coming week at the Etchells Nationals. It looks like it's going to be really windy, you know, 17 to 25 knots. So for those of you that are going there this weekend, highly encourage you guys to kind of take all this and put it in practice almost immediately. 
Um, so this is a good example of a full versus flat. So, you know, Benj and those guys, they were, they were, were doing Benj things and going really fast. They're the 1427 car. Um, this is Peter Vasella and the 1491 brand new Ontario. Uh, what, what, uh, kind of sticks out to you right away? Yeah, it was, uh, it was a great weekend to watch. It was great. We had, we had three days of really breezy conditions in a row, which is nice because you can learn and develop every day and see what's going on. And, you know, after about two days of watching from the coach boat, I could just look and see very quickly who was going to be going fast and who was going to be going slow. It, it takes a, a little bit. The boats, it's not like one boat's foiling and one boat isn't, you know, they're just charging along at, at slightly different speeds. But I, I could look, this was, I think, the last day, the first race. And uh, these guys both had pretty good starts. Benj was to lured and charging along. And so was Peter. And he was hanging in there. And eventually Peter had attacked and, and Benj tacked as well. But I could tell after they came off the line, like I'm just looking at Benj's sail. You can start to see the overbend wrinkles. It's, it's a little fuzzy on my screen. I don't know. You, hopefully you guys have a better screen. But you can start to see the overbend. You can see how flat the sections of his mane are. And you can, I can see Peter's mane is just a little too full overall. You know, they're doing a nice job. He's, he's got the travel down a little bit. You know, he's got a great team. He's got nice sails and a great crew and all that. But Ben was just charging a little better. And, and the fact was he was just flatter on the mane. In fact, Ben had the flattest mane. He, he could get it flatter than anybody else out there. And after the regatta was over, he actually asked me, he said, hey, how, you know, want to get the main even flatter what you know what can we do and i said well bench you know you every time it was windy you got to the weather mark first or second you're, you're already the flattest guy you can we could do something flatter but you're really going to be in a corner and then you know the boat needs power in the in, in other conditions so you know going further than that probably isn't necessary we didn't get over 20 knots so so we don't know but uh he was definitely the flattest and he was definitely one of one of, if not the fastest boat upwind in the, in those flatter conditions. He's not afraid to drop the traveler. You know, he will get the boat on its feet. He'll dump that traveler all the way down when a big puff hits and then pull it halfway back up. And, you know, his four stay is always tight, tight, tight. Everybody's caught up. And I remember I did some coaching five or six years ago with him or maybe longer. And and he always had the four stay tight and he was, wasn't that quick in light air. You could find him all over the race course. You're like, where's Ben? Oh, yeah, but over there with the four stay real flat, that's Ben's. He was, but now he's, he's much more dynamic, but he's tough in the breeze. And I think he, they, they've got the boat set up with a really tight four stay. They're not afraid to move the mass butt forward so they can pull more, more back stay on and get that thing just as straight as it can be. So it seems yeah. to work pretty good. Yeah. They were going really well and they yeah, said they were. They sailed very well too. Um, uh, so Aaron Houston is asking uh, which mainsail does uh, Benji use? I believe he uses the PCFM, correct? Yeah, yeah. Very so, few guys use the plus. Almost everybody uses the PCFM. It's standard mainsail, radial head. Those are the exact same mainsail, both of those pictures. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you, you've, you've touched on force day sag, and this was a big point of emphasis in the last webinar in light air about knowing when you have too much force day sag. So, you know, we're at the other end of the power spectrum where we're trying to depower. And how do you know when you, the, the force day oh, is tight enough, basically? So why don't you walk us through that? You've already touched on a lot of the controls, but, you know, yeah. visually you're sailing along. How do you know? Okay, my four stays in a good spot. Yeah, biggest biggest problem or the biggest telltale sign that you see is if you're going upwind and the four stays bouncing a lot. You know, it, it's hard to get it completely tight. This is a picture from almost perfect straight on that uh, we we take, and you can see in the middle where the spreaders are. We can just see almost the whole spreader bracket you know, on the leeward side. So that's why it's really nice to have someone look at your boat from off the walk, from on the coach boat off of, and, and take a photo. That's pretty much as tight as you can get it in that condition. When it's bouncing around a lot, if you think about a, a, a wing on an airplane 
and you, you look out there and if you saw the front edge of the wing while you were flying somewhere and you saw the front end bouncing around and moving a whole bunch, you'd be like, wow, this is this, this plane could fall out of the sky because the wing was stalling and all that. So if you think of the force day bouncing and how much stall is happening every time it moves, it's changing the angle of attack with, with every wave and every puff. You want to reduce that as much as you can. So I, I'm always looking at the, at the force day, which is kind of hard to do because your angle always changes. So it's nice if, if I'm the skipper, like I always sit in the exact same spot and look at the force day, like where it vanishes behind the mast, how far down, or, or hopefully it doesn't vanish behind it. It stays up in the whole time. And how much of the jib can you see? Can I see those, that third set of telltales? You look all the way up, look up the jib there and like, like between the USA lows on the jib, there's a third set of telltales up there. And if you could see those as a skipper, you'd be excited because your, your force day is really tight and that makes the jib flatter, helps open the slot more and is really nice. So that's what, that's what we're looking for when it's breezy all the time. And it's just always helping us to go upwind nice and tight. Yeah. And one, one thing that I do, you know, I've been trying for, you know, years to try to figure out how to, what's a good repeatable way to figure out how much force they sag you do. What I sometimes do is, I'll put the boom in the center of the boat and I will go and I'll just lean on the boom and I'll just look straight out and just see how much of the jib is appearing like in my, in my eyesight. And it's not a great tool, but I've, I've never really tried, had a good way of figuring out how much head stay sag we have. And in light air, it's, it's an, it's an effective technique because you can also see the head stay bouncing and how active it is. Um, and in breeze, you can also kind of do the same thing, just sort of see how active the head stay is. So that, that's my little technique. It's probably not very good, but it's, it's something. It gives me an idea of how much we have. No, you got to have something. It's hard, it's hard to judge. And uh, so, you know, when, when you get everything uh, looking good, you, you kind of look like Bench. And, uh, you know, he, he's a good looking guy and he's, he's got good looking sales and good looking team. And, you know, he really does a great job. And he, I can't we, we can't emphasize this enough. He was the fastest boat, um, arguably, on the race course in that Coral Reef Cup. And he hikes hard. You know, that's one thing, too. And, you know, this the guys who drive the boat, um, you know, just because you got the stick in the hand doesn't mean you uh, can't put your butt over there and uh and hike so benj does a really nice job and his team you know his team is Stu mcnay and dave hughes and ian liberty you know all those guys you know ian i went to school with him in college he didn't hike that hard and luckily Stu and dave have been positive influences on him and now he he's one of the hardest hiking actual sailors out there so um definitely uh you know and you can just tell you can tell so Dave Janis, a local San Diego guy, he says, for a place like San Diego, do you still go for this main on hard and traveler down setup when the breeze is up and there is swell? Hey, Dave, uh, you're getting ahead. That's coming up in the next segment. So just hang tight. Uh, but thank you. Yeah. So if anybody has any questions, the chat is open and you know, feel free to fire them at, at us. We, we had a question about do we sell flying Scott scales? sales in Australia. Uh, we do. Um, you can contact uh, Z Corwitz, Flying Scott expert. Uh, he can help you out with that. So let's, uh, let's transition to this big wave, um, you know, windier uh, setup in San Diego. Uh, like I was alluding to earlier, we, we started on Friday in a traditional kind of northwesterly wind, fairly flat water, where a lot of those old techniques that we just talked about were very applicable but then the next day was uh, quite windy and um from southerly yes yeah, south a windy southerly which is kind of rare in san diego and there's big waves and big chop and man i tried those flat techniques and we got absolutely smoked but you know who didn't try that eric so eric why what what was your telltale giveaway to switching to a more full setup and talk to us a little bit about that Oh, I'm going to give a lot of credit to uh, to uh, Dave Allman, who was our coach for the weekend. We were working with uh, Jim Cunningham, and we'd uh, we've 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 seen this a bit before. 
and we're kind of on the polar opposite spectrum of uh, how we set the main up from the flat water to the bumpy water. We always want to think about, hey, you know, how do we, how does the boat effectively go through the water? How do we get it to be happy? So in, in flat water, it goes pretty straight on its own. It just kind of, we get it set up. There's a nice rudder angle. There's nice sheet tension, four stay tight. Then it shifts to San Diego, big ocean swell. And in this picture, you can see it's a little bit lighter. Nobody's hiking too hard on either boat because we're, we're trying to power the boat up, but you can see how full the main is. But you can also see the, maybe not as much, but the waves, the waves are quite big. So if we think about it, when the boat's going through the swell or it's pounding a lot, you know, we, we think about how much the mast is moving around throughout the air. And unlike the flat water where there's pretty much a constant angle of apparent wind at the top of the mast, in the waves, it's all over the place. So we want it to be, you know, for lack of a better way to describe it, you know, less wrong more often. It's not gonna be the same. So we need power, we need twist, we need it to be forgiving. So to, so to get the power, we pull the traveler up, we make the main very full, we make sure the shrouds aren't too tight, that we don't have too much backstay. We don't have too much main sheet tension. And, and we get the power by pulling the traveler up. And we adjust the traveler for the, for the, uh, for the, the amount of heel we have. And then the other thing you kind of got to be careful in this picture is you can't drag the spinnaker sheets in the water. It may seem trivial, but somebody on that boat should have pulled it up. It's probably probably should have been me, but Payson's sitting there next to me. He has a little bit of a, of an out because he's a star sailor and he doesn't have to worry about the spinnaker sheets on the star boat, but the two of us, I'll, I'll take the heat for that one a little bit. But uh, looking at this sail compared to the previous photo, look how deep the main is. Look how powerful it is. Look how, look at that center stripe. It's just power, power. And there's a little bit of four stay sag going on there too, trying to make the boat forgiving, max power there. Yeah, and the wrinkles along the luff, you know, those are different yeah. types of wrinkles that from the overbend, um, you know, so the, the overbend is more of like a, a crease almost through the sail where, um, you know, these are just nice, you know, almost like speed wrinkles, you know, coming off of the luff of the main. Um, yeah. So that, you know, that's a good telltale way and to, to see the differences between the full and the, and the flat. Uh, Ned Johnst Johnston wants to know, where was your mass ram in these big wave conditions? All the way back. Yeah. All the way back against the partners. Yeah. The one thing I learned in this is, you know, we, in Miami, we talked about burping the, the ram a little bit forward to get the bottom of the main flat enough. In these conditions, you just want juice and, and that, you know, the mass ram helps create the juice. So you're happy to to bring it all the way back in the partners and not worry about moving the mass butt forward, but just getting it, getting it back. And, you know, this, like you said, this is kind of the, the lighter of the two days, which was, you know, 12 knots, just nice, nice ocean sailing. And then we had conditions where we were more, you know, 16 knots, 16, 17 knots um, on the, the back half of the second day and the back half of the third day. So, you know, are, are those, Techniques still applicable even as you get more overpowered? Yeah, yeah, very much so. The the difference is you, you gotta you gotta to control the heel, you just have to ease the main sheet a bit. And a lot of times that seems a little counterintuitive, right? The boat needs a lot of power, it wants to go. How do we make the boat heel over and go? We 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 trim the main harder, you know, we get that top to work, but here we have enough wind here. We've got 15, 16, 17. So we probably had 18 knot puffs, right, Alex? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. We had a lot of so the boat has a lot of power, lots of power. So it's going to heal over if we have the traveler up. So we just made sure we never over trimmed the main. We 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 eased it out. It had a lot of twist. You know, in Miami, we were trying to sheet the main as, as hard as possible to help contribute to the four stay sag. Here, if we thought the force day was sagging too much, we pull the back stay on harder and harder, and we don't see the overbend because we've, we've got the sheet eased so much. We've got it eased, we've got the vein very forgiving. So the boat, when it rocks through, rolls through those big waves over the swell, it's just got that nice forgiving open top. 
you know, a lot of times we think, gosh, where's the power coming? Where's the power coming? Remember, this is windy. We're, we're hiking hard. We're trying to make the boat, you know, go forward through the water. It's got plenty of grunt everywhere. So nice and eased on the sheet. You can see on this one, as opposed to the other one, the top telltale there, it's flowing all the time and it's open, it's forgiving. Look how deep those sections are. That's that stripe in the middle by the, through the USA. Look how deep and full that is. On the other photos from Miami, we were so flat there. We were starting to see overbend wrinkles where the sail was as flat as we could possibly make it and still be flying. Here, we're trying to make it as full as it can be and nice and twisty. Yeah, no, for sure. And you know, when I when our boat was done breaking and we could actually uh, participate in the front of the fleet in some of these races, you know, I, one of the techniques that I use was as I just have the have the main sheet in an all purpose setting, have the traveler and a juiced up setting, you know, maybe car, car and a half above center line. And I just had the back stay in my hand. And every time the boat started to feel like we were going to load up, which was generally on the tops of the waves, I would just pull on the back stay super hard. That would drive the boat forward. And then we get into the troughs and I would just let the back stay all the way off. And yeah. You know, that just, and I would just play the backstay and boats that were kind of chasing their tail, traveler, main sheet, backstay, all that stuff. And they weren't able to simplify it. We were able to just motor on them. So, you know, yeah, and probably, probably when you ease the backstay all the way off too, Alex, you, you were still flowing at the top, right? The, yes. The, the leech yes. wasn't shutting down. You know, that technique works in flat water too, but you've got the sheet tighter and you can stall the top of the main, but you probably weren't doing that, huh? No, no, the, yeah, the never stalling it in this condition. No, never in waves. We need that telltale to flow all the time. It's a little flatter water. We want that on. We want it stalling fifty percent of the time. When it's when it's you know flat water and medium air, we we can stall it all the time when we're trying to point high. But here we've got enough pressure. We want the boat going through the water. We want it to go fast, and we'll get the height through the speed. Yeah. Yeah, unless Chuck was too low and then the jib telltales were just kind of stalling because oh, Chuck, now it's Chuck's fault. You got to push the tiller over, bro. <laughs> anyway, you can see we've really advanced. Now go back to that photo. We've really gotten yeah. a lot better. Spin sheets are in the boat. <laughs> you can't see the other side, but we're on the ball a little bit more now. Hey, we left, but it's that's very true. important. No drag, right? We do no all drag. that hiking with stuff dragging in the water. That's no good. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, and that kind of brings us to our last point, a couple points here, guys, is, uh, you know, you still got to hike. This is Steve Gerling. He probably hikes, you know, kind of the hardest skipper. He sails with gold medalist Max from Sweden, not hiking as hard as the skipper. The, you know, the, the skipper needs to be a participant in the hiking uh, in Breeze because, you know, the, it, it, it all adds up. So that we, we got a couple of shots here. There's Steve hiking hard. And then, you know, we got, uh, another star sailor, Ante on the right. Um, and then on the and left, Ante's is, crew, Ante's crew's hiking hard too. Look at him. Senate, Senate. Bischoff, shout out to him. It's working hard there. Looks pretty good. You know, Maine looks nice. Jib looks nice. Not too much heel. And then we kind of, we picked on our youngest skipper in the fleet here a little bit. I, I, I sent him these photos. He's, he promised me to hike harder. Mike Morley. That's, uh, He's a great kid from uh, Texas, learning the ropes, getting into the star a whole bunch. But Mike, got to get that butt out over the rail. Look at Ante's butt. He's out there. His that's that's some good hiking on the on the Swedish blue over there on the right. That that yeah. really is. That's good work. He the skipper is wearing hiking pants. If you, if a skipper, I would be so excited if my skipper. <laughs> If Argyle rocked up with some hiking pants, maybe I can get get him some for his birthday or something. <laughs> But if your skipper rocks up with some hiking pants, you definitely, A, should not be out hiked by them. B, you should be encouraged that they are going to participate in the hiking. And, and C, you got to be a little embarrassed that, you, you know, you didn't, you're not wearing hiking pants or, you know, you're getting, you just got to match their intensity. So that's a good um, call. That's and good then call. lastly, you know, all these tips, the mass rim, the four stay sag, the you know, all this stuff, the hiking hard, you still have to race the boat well. You got to race the boat well to do well in this class. You know, I, I think it's arguably one of the most competitive classes in the world um, for a wide variety of different reasons, but you still have to get around the course and get the kite down and not be yelling at the skipper to head up. And then the skipper saying, no, I can't head up. 
Chris, there's a spinnaker <laughs> out the lured side of the boat. Chuck, get the spinnaker down. What are we doing? So get the knot out. Get the don't be this guy. That's right. That's right. But let's just say, yeah, I think everybody we take away, there's great points. Let's think about that when we go out sailing next time. What's what's the water like? You know, in addition to how much wind strength we have, we think about uh, how windy is it? Do we need to power the boat up? Do we need to depower the boat? If the water's flat, we're going to set the sails up flatter, lower drag, tighter forestay. If it's if it's bumpy, we want to think about power. The boat still needs a lot of power, but we want to keep it on its feet. We need the boat to be forgiving, so so the skipper's able to put the bow down, go through the waves fast, nice and forgiving. If we're working so hard, my one big tip I always think about: if I'm working really hard to sail the boat, I got to adjust everything every three seconds, and I got to drive a lot and more main sheet, less main sheet, more back stable, then then it's 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 got to be easy. The boat wants to do the work, and it's really hard when the waves are really big because the boat loads and unloads. And I think Alex made a great point about. How, how, how he simplified it. He got it basically down to one control that could handle the, the different power that the boat felt when they had, and it's pretty basic, right? When it's windy, it's how much helm you have. You either got too much helm or not enough helm. And if you don't have enough helm, well, you got to power the boat up somehow. If it's flat water, trim harder, pull the traveler up. If it's breezy, if it's bumpy, then let the back stay off a little bit, you know? So but make it simple, let the boat do the work. Bumpy water, twist, flat water, tight leeches, flat, racing around the track, get a good start, have good crew work, run the spin higher down, don't look like these guys. Yeah, and you know, let us know, I'll be in Miami, you know, starting this week, or starting tomorrow, I, I head there tomorrow. Um, it's going to be really windy all week. If you guys have any questions, I'm a total open book. Feel free to come up and ask me questions. And, uh, you know, Eric's not going to be there, but he's available by email all the time. He's Mr. Worldwide. He's always around. We're two pretty approachable dudes. And, um, you know, Eric likes Stella. I'm a Coors Light man. And, you know... <laughs> We'll basically share our secrets to the world uh, of etchel sailing if if either one of those beverages gets put in front of us. So loosens lips, definitely. <laughs> the alcohol does. Cool. All right, Eric. Well, sounds good. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Everybody, thanks All for right. tuning in, and we'll talk to you guys later. All right. Have a good good time in Miami, everybody. Let us know how things go. Take care. Bye. <laughs>